Today on Wavelengths, Armored Core 6 gameplay finally hits the internet, and most normal people seem to be excited about it. I have played the Final Fantasy 16 demo twice, well, one and a half times, and I have a lot to say about it. We finally got some information about what Star Wars Outlaws, the new game from Ubisoft and Massive, is going to look like when you're actually playing the video game, and honestly, a lot of other stuff, so let's get into it. This is Wavelengths. It's still a show about video game news. I am still Brendan Bigley, and as of this morning, at least time of this recording, uh, it seems like the press all got the same five minute piece of footage of Armored Core 6 gameplay that they could publish on their various websites. And I think the best usage of this five minutes that I saw came from Vati Vidya. A link to his channel down below. If you aren't a person who plays Souls games and FromSoft games, you might not know who Vati Vidya is, but he's like the internet's collective keeper of the lore. He's the guy who's gonna piece together all of the lore of all the FromSoft games for you, uh, which naturally means that he is also checking out Armored Core 6. But outside of that five minute demo, some select people of press, Vati included, were able to actually go and watch a hands-on demonstration of how this game is gonna play. Now, I really like Vati Vidya's video. Vati Vidya's video. Vati Vidya's video for two reasons. The first being that he's the only person that I found online who was like, the hands-on demonstration I was able to watch showed the HUD on the screen, but the gameplay video that they sent us that we were allowed to post didn't have the HUD on screen. So I'm just gonna go ahead and overlay what I remember the HUD to look like on screen. I think that's great. Love a good HUD, specifically in a game where you are in a big ass mech and you're fighting other big ass mechs. Uh, the HUD is very important, I think, to the aesthetic. But the second thing is that Vati is specifically known for covering Souls games. He has a really unique input, specifically as somebody who has been covering the lore of Elden Ring and Dark Souls and all of these games for years. But before all of that, before all of those Souls games, there was Armored Core. If you don't know the lineage of From Software, they made all these Armored Core games, and then they made Demon Souls, and then they made Armored Core 5, I think the year after Demon Souls, and then from then on out, Souls games all the way down, my guy. So after Elden Ring comes out, I think a lot of people are asking themselves, like, okay, what's next for From Software? There have been rumors that they're making a mech game. People didn't know for sure that it was going to be an Armored Core game, but like, it was probably going to be an Armored Core game. And I didn't even know about this, but there seems to be some kind of kerfuffle amongst the From Software community, which I guess I shouldn't be surprised because this is the same community that's like get good and just has like the most toxic attitude about like, oh, if you're not playing this game this specific way, then you're not playing this game correctly. Really like childish gatekeepy bullshit. But apparently there's been this growing fear, I would say, amongst the Armored Core community and the Souls community specifically that too much Souls influence would make its way into Armored Core, which like there's a lot of stuff to say about that. The first being like, of course, Souls influence is going to bleed into Armored Core. That's what that studio has been doing for 10 plus years at this point. It would be really, really weird if they just pretended they never did that and just went back to making the same Armored Core stuff they were making on the PS2 and PS3. Not acknowledging the franchise that has put them really, like really, really on the map, like Elden Ring becoming a global phenomenon outside of just people who play video games, like ignoring that wouldn't make much sense. But also, like, people's brains don't work that way. The studio makeup, the people who work at From Software, that's that's what they know now. They know soul stuff. I think the beautiful thing about From Software, the most interesting thing about them to me as a developer, is that ever since finishing up the Souls trilogy and and started with Bloodborne, I guess really you you could throw you know the timing's weird, but you could start with Bloodborne. Bloodborne became them starting to branch out and saying, how do we take this thing that we've really really honed over the years and gotten really good at and start to chip away at our own biases, chip away at our own understanding of how this should work and see if we can branch outside of that and make something new. And that's when you get things like Bloodborne and Sekiro culminating in Elden Ring. From Software takes chances over and over and over again, and they always pay off because they have an extremely high internal bar that they set for themselves in terms of game quality. And that brings me to my second point, which is that change is good, man. If Armored Core 6 came out and looked exactly and played exactly like Armored Core 5, that would be bad. <laughs> How many franchises have gone under over the years because they just continued to release more of the same sequel to sequel to sequel? From Software taking an over decade long gap from Armored Core and coming back having made some of the most revolutionary video games we've ever seen is a good thing because that is going to influence the future of Armored Core. And then working on Armored Core, surprise, surprise, 
is going to influence their work on other video games as well, including maybe a sequel to Elden Ring, or if they ever return to Bloodborne, or whatever. If I pick up Bloodborne 2 and it has inspiration from Armored Core, that would be the sickest shit I've ever played in my life. I look at this gameplay footage from Armored Core and I just get so hyped up. I don't know how you could watch this and not be like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen and I can't believe I'm going to be able to do that with these two hands. The idea that I can go into an encounter like I have in a bunch of other Souls games and fail that encounter, you know, lose against an enemy, lose against a boss, whatever, and stand back and ask myself, okay, why did I lose here? The answer to that question in Souls games usually ends up being, I didn't use all the resources I had at my disposal, and also, maybe I wasn't, like, reading the enemy attack patterns correctly. And all of that is going to be true in Armored Core. It just adds this second layer of, you can also pull up a spreadsheet of the different pieces of your mech and fine tune all the pieces of your mech. And maybe the answer lies in that big ass spreadsheet. And maybe that doesn't sound exciting to you, but that sounds exciting to me. And from what I've heard from people who love Armored Core, that's also what they love about Armored Core. And that is very clearly still present in this video game. Adding atop that the really intense focus that FromSoft has had on refining their battle and their melee combat, that's just like the recipe for a really good video game, right? So I don't fully know what's going on in terms of the community being upset about this Armored Core gameplay, but I think it looks incredible. I really can't wait to play it. I'm sorry if you feel like it's not for you, but it definitely looks like it's going to be for me. And speaking of big changes, big risks, and games that are for me, the Final Fantasy 16 demo is incredible. I'll be honest, Final Fantasy 16 is a game that I've been kind of curious about and hopeful about from afar. It's a game that I haven't been like totally convinced I'm going to love. And if I'm being honest, a lot of that stems from the fact that I haven't really loved most Final Fantasy games. I think I've enjoyed my time with a lot of them, but I haven't completed many of them. I've completed Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy VII Remake, and I've played like 5 to 10 to 20 hours of a lot of other ones. I will say, though, all of those hours, all of those experiences, those games that I finished, all of that has happened between the release of Final Fantasy XV and now. I have become more of a Final Fantasy fan since XV came out than I was before XV came out. So this is the first one that's coming out where I feel like I get to be part of the excitement in a way. But that said, this game is bringing a lot of changes to the table, right? It is fully action combat. They have brought on the team from Devil May Cry. They have brought in some of the team from Kingdom Hearts. They're making an action game. You don't even get the like pseudo turn-based thing that Final Fantasy VII Remake was doing. This is like just an action game through and through. On top of that, there have been these constant comparisons from the development team themselves to Game of Thrones, a show I do not like, and God of War, a game I do like, but I don't know if I need Final Fantasy to be that. And the big reason I get worried when I hear those comparisons is not because I don't want Final Fantasy to go in that direction, but more specifically that Final Fantasy used to be, even when I didn't like it, even when I was a kid and I you know, would see them coming out and I had friends who would get into them, but I just could never get into them. Even in that era, everyone acknowledged that Final Fantasy was pushing the boundaries of what video games could be every single time they came out. I mean, that's where the name comes from. That's where Final Fantasy fantasy comes from it was supposed to be you know this team's last shot at making something great and then they did and of course it turned into one of the biggest rpg franchises on the planet if not the biggest but i think over the years you know there have been some hits and there have been some misses and final fantasy 15 i don't think was as big a hit as people wanted it to be i don't think it was as big a hit as square enix wanted it to be they released you know an anime and a movie and a game and spin-off games and a bunch of other stuff that all compiled to make a really confusing kind of mess of a product. Now, I actually like Final Fantasy XV a lot. Of all the Final Fantasy games I've tried, that's the one I've played maybe the most of, but not finished. But even I, a person who is a little bit of an apologist for that game, can acknowledge that that game wasn't what it needed to be. And there's something that makes my skin crawl a little bit inherently when I hear that Final Fantasy, this game that's supposed to be pushing the boundaries of the entire medium is pulling from God of War, a game that came out in 2018, and Game of Thrones, again, a television show I don't like very much. Now, having played the demo, I don't really see either of those influences in there. Like, Game of Thrones is an influence in so much as uh, it's a medieval fantasy setting. And, like, it's a little bit darker than it has been in the past. People curse. People say curse words. I guess, like, that's edgy. And the God of War comparison, I think, is interesting because I can see where they're coming from. Like, God of War, when you get towards the end of that game, specifically, like, the post-game in God of War and God of War 2, 
those fights get really brutally difficult and they kind of show the high ceiling that God of War's combat can hit. But when I think of God of War's combat, although I do think it has a lot of nuance and a lot of player expression in a lot of the decisions that you can make from a moment to moment combat experience, I think it's a really kind of grounded experience. I think God of War's combat is supposed to feel really tactile and really weighty. And like every time you press a button, you can feel the weight of Kratos doing every single action. Whereas Final Fantasy's combat, the combat in this game is so flowy and free and and energetic. There's so much flashiness on display here. You can really see where the Devil May Cry and Kingdom Hearts teams like put their stamp on the combat here. Because every single moment is like you're doing the flashiest, coolest thing. Actually, one of my favorite moments from this big, long stream they had just kind of showing off a bunch of aspects of Final Fantasy 16 was they gave the combat designer, who is the combat designer of Devil May Cry, a controller to play one of the combat encounters on a really high difficulty. And you could just see that the ceiling of this game is way, way, way higher than anyone had ever anticipated. And knowing that I will probably never hit that, but I can strive to hit that, that's an exciting prospect for me, knowing that the further I make it into this game, the more time I give to Final Fantasy 16, the closer I can get to looking like a god playing a video game. That's really cool. That's really cool. And then on top of that comes the story. And I think this is the most interesting a Final Fantasy story has been to me, like right at go. The closest comparison I can make weirdly is Final Fantasy 12, believe it or not. Final Fantasy XII is a game that is very clearly inspired by Lord of the Rings and the Star Wars prequels. You can see it in the art direction, you can hear it in the script and in the line delivery, but I think one of the most interesting inspirations that it took from the Star Wars prequels specifically is the focus on politics. And I think that the game really gets in its own way in that regard. But if you really invest the time and effort it takes to like fully comprehend what's going on there, fully comprehend all the players around the world, Final Fantasy XII's story is pretty interesting. Final Fantasy XVI's story is trying to do a similar thing, but it's much more streamlined. You have the geopolitical conflict thing, warring factions. It's been in a lot of Final Fantasy games. Where I think this one really differs is that all of these different factions are at war, and they all have an ace. Those aces come in the form of the summons from previous Final Fantasy games. And this is a thing we've known about for a long time, but really seeing it up close and personal in the demo is a completely different thing than what we've heard from the different reveal trailers over the past couple of years. The way... This is amazing. But the way this works is that most of these factions have one person who is able to essentially become a summon. And when they do that, they become a frightening destructive force. I would consider it like the nuclear option of the Final Fantasy universe. One of the first ones that you see actually is Titan. And when Titan shows up on the battlefield in this war, in this like opening prologue sequence, he is so gigantic he is the size of many mountains. He's taller than many mountains, but also he's fighting for one specific side of this battle. And he is just, as he's stepping, destroying his own army, wiping out his own people in an effort to destroy the other side as well. The unintended friendly fire casualties on display are nightmarish in a way that they should be. And I think that's one of the things about this game is that this game gives stuff like that the weight that it deserves. Titan is scary. Shiva is scary. The Phoenix is scary. Ifrit is scary. When these things show up in the world, they are terrifying. And I think it was a really brilliant move to have you as a person on the ground when Titan and Shiva are fighting one another. Because you and your team are just little guys and there are mountains being moved around you. At any moment, an entire mountain can come crumbling onto your face, or Shiva could create a giant wall of ice that freezes you in place and you die instantly. It's so scary to be around these things. And then of course, there's the other angle, which is you get to play as these things. And I won't spoil it, I won't show it, but the demo ends with you getting to play as one of these summons. And that sequence, experiencing that, going through that combat, so cinematic, so vivid, colorful, horrifying i kept thinking to myself this is final fantasy again finally this is the thing that i'd always heard about when final fantasy 10 came out and i went to a friend's house and i couldn't believe that video games could look that good i was thinking that again playing final fantasy 16's demo now look i don't know if that's going to be the whole game i don't know if the whole game is going to feel that way but 
this demo was enough for me to go from like cautiously optimistic about Final Fantasy 16. Oh, I'll check it out. I probably won't finish it just like all the other ones to like, this game's going to be my whole personality now, man. I am so excited for Final Fantasy 16. I can't believe it comes out next week. Put me in coach, you know? And another game that I'm interested in, but cautiously optimistic about is Star Wars Outlaws, which we saw more of at Ubisoft Forward. It was revealed at the Xbox event. And then we got to see a long developer commentary section where they showed a bunch of gameplay at Ubisoft Forward. Now, this game is coming from Massive Studios, who made The Division, The Division 2, two games I really liked. Uh, but they're also working on Avatar Frontiers of Pandora, another confusing game in its own right. It looks like Far Cry, but on Pandora, it's a whole thing. But I was wondering if the Division influence would show up in Star Wars Outlaws at all. And and I think from the first look that we got from the Xbox event, I thought not really. But honestly, the more of the Ubisoft forward developer commentary I watched, the more I started to get like, oh yeah, this is the team that made The Division. Because although this is an open world single player experience, doesn't have the like pseudo MMO kind of Destiny-esque thing The Division had going for it. A lot of the same philosophies that apply to The Division apply to this. There was a whole section of this developer commentary where they were talking about how their main thesis statement for all of their combat design is the idea of making you the resourceful underdog. They want tension in every encounter. And that's exactly how The Division played. The Division was like a frequently scary video game because you were never sure if you had exactly what you needed to make it through a space. And if you were walking into a building or a sewage system or whatever, there was always the chance that you were going to get your ass rocked. And that seems to be the case with Star Wars Outlaws. And I think that's really cool because especially coming hot off the heels of playing a game like Jedi Survivor, which I played all the way through. I mean, that's a game where you, you're you a god, right? You're, you're a Jedi. You have all these powers. You have a lightsaber. Like, yeah, there's the soul's influence in the combat and stuff. But by the time you're done with that game, you're really good at it. And really nothing stands in your way at all. Instead, putting you in the shoes of Kay Vess, who is somebody who just has like a blaster and a little like kind of cat alien pet friend thing. Things are going to be scary again, man. In fact, there's one quote that one of the developers had that really sticks with me uh, where they were doing an encounter. You know, you could see Kay and she was hiding behind some cover. She was shooting a bunch of people and more and more and more evil guys were flooding into the area, this like arena where they're having their combat. And the developer said something to the effect of sometimes the best decision is to just get out of there. And you could see her just book it out. And I have done that exact thing in The Division so many times. There's so many experiences where I would run into a space and be like, oh, no, thank you. Bail. And it's cool they're giving you all that agency in combat. That feels very Division-y to me. But it's also cool they're giving you a lot of agency in the storytelling. At least that's what they're saying. You know, we'll see how much this really feels like you're making choices. I feel like we are, you know, in this era of a lot of games saying that they give you a lot of narrative choice and then who knows how much that really comes through. But the developers were talking about how like, depending on what jobs you take from what factions will either give you more options with those factions or close you off to missions with other factions. They showed a dialogue tree at one point where you know you were kind of negotiating, quote unquote, negotiating with a member of the empire and it was like, do you wanna bribe them? Do you wanna not bribe them? Do you wanna just like stick them up at gunpoint and then run away? And then they ended up doing that and then raised their Grand Theft Auto wanted level. And it literally said wanted in like huge letters on the screen, which is, I mean, that's right from GTA. I don't know. I, I, I need to see more of this game still. I think I'm not totally sold on it, even though this is like exactly the kind of game I always want in the Star Wars universe. Um, I'm not quite there yet, but I am cautiously optimistic. So we'll see. Jason Trier over at Bloomberg published a new report this morning talking to a bunch of developers inside CD Projekt Red, the makers of The Witcher, but more specifically Cyberpunk 2077, who are working on their new expansion called Phantom Liberty. It's the one that has Idris Elba in it. Keanu Reeves is coming back. But I think what's been really interesting about Cyberpunk 2077 is like that game came out, was obviously a mess. People didn't like it very much. People didn't feel like they got what they paid for. People didn't feel like they got what they were promised. PlayStation had to remove it from the PlayStation Store because it was crashing so much that they were like, we actually just can't sell this. I think the only time they've ever done that. It was not good. It was not a good release. But over time, Cyberpunk 2077 has been kind of coming back a little bit. There have been a couple patches here and there that have really like kind of righted the ship. The specific team members who uh, were creating a, a, a workplace filled with hostility have stepped down and left the company. We have a new game director who has stepped in to shuttle those patches out, but also work on Phantom Liberty. And it's a really interesting report because it really shows a company that is acknowledging that they made a mistake and is doing everything they can to make it right. The team says that they feel like they've been given carte blanche, and that includes like 
money to be able to create the thing that they had promised initially. And honestly, it sounds like it's paying off. A lot of the hands-on stuff I've heard about from people who have played the Phantom Liberty expansion are like, yeah, this thing rocks. Like, this thing fucks and, and is actually, like... I, I saw one headline, I, I can't remember who wrote it, but somebody wrote a headline that was like, Phantom Liberty rewrites the DNA of Cyberpunk 2077, which is, I think, the nicest thing you can say about it. And I'll be honest, I played some of Cyberpunk 2077, and I liked it enough. I played it before that big patch had come out, but it sounds like with that patch and this expansion, they're like really, really, really not rebuilding the game from the ground up because there are some systems in there that like... I don't know why they would do that, but it does sound like Phantom Liberty is going to make the base Cyberpunk 2077 a much better game that is much closer to the vision that we all had in our heads when it was announced. But I think the real headline, the real takeaway here for me from this report is specifically Jason's conversation with management saying that management is like really focused on making sure that they're not crunching internally at at CD Projekt Red anymore because that was an outward promise that they had made. CD Projekt said like, hey, we're not going to crunch on our games. And then like very publicly, that ended up being a lie. And the director of of this expansion went on to say like, we have built systems internally to make sure that people don't crunch now. We have like automated systems that will tell us if people have been at their desk and working for too long and we can go tell them to stop. And big shout out to Jason, honestly, for this. But uh, he also went and then asked and and did some reporting and did some digging with some like lower level developers at CD Projekt. So we're not just like taking the the guy who runs the studio at face value, but they also kind of corroborated that story and said like, yeah, things have gotten better. They're not like perfect, but they've gotten better than they were. Progress is progress. You know what I mean? Like, I I think that that's great. You know, I, I think it's so important to point out when there are injustices happening in workplaces like this, you know, when, when work conditions are bad and people are being like paid unfairly and treated unfairly and whatever, I think it's just as important to do follow up reporting and see if, you know, those things have been addressed and fixed. And it sounds like CD project is trying to do that. And, you know, kudos to that because it's hard, it's hard to do that. It's hard to fix the internal culture at a company. I'm hopeful that all of this is true. I imagine it is. And if so, then, you know, respect. Last but not least, I just have to shout out that uh, McDonald's made a game for the Game Boy Color. I saw this all over the internet already. You've probably seen it too. The thing about this, though, that I find is really funny. So the whole the whole deal is that it's Grimace's birthday. He's like the big purple guy. Uh, it was Grimace's birthday, so they made a game called Grimace's Birthday for the Game Boy Color. You can play it on their website. You can download a ROM and play it on actual Game Boy hardware, which is amazing. But the thing about this and the reason I wanted to bring it up, the game is really good. It's like a really good Game Boy Color game. You're Grimace on a skateboard, rolling around trying to pick up purple shakes that you can bring to Grimace's birthday party. Uh, and honestly, it just feels like really tight. It's a it's a like well-made game. And that's hard to do. It's hard to make a really tight Game Boy Color game. Anyway, that's Grimace's birthday. You can go play that on, uh, on McDonald's website. <laughs> Link is in the show notes, baby. Anyway, that's going to be it for me. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you're listening to the show, please leave a review. That would help so, so, so much. If you're watching the show on YouTube or on Spotify, please like, comment, subscribe, do all that stuff. It really does help a lot. Please share the show with a friend. That helps even more. Word of mouth is the greatest thing on earth. Uh, and hey, you can follow me all over the internet. Uh, My name is Brendan Bigley. This is Wavelengths. I'll catch you later. Bye, everybody.